A Traveller in Wartime by Winston Churchill This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times A Traveller in Wartime by Winston Churchill Preface I am reprinting here, in response to requests, certain recent experiences in Great Britain and France. These were selected in the hope of conveying to American readers some idea of the atmosphere of what it is like in these countries under the immediate shadow of the battle clouds. It was what I myself most wished to know. My idea was first to send home my impressions while they were fresh, and to refrain as far as possible from comment and judgment until I should have had time to make a fuller survey. Hence I chose as a title for these articles, intended to be a preliminary, a traveller in wartime. I tried to banish from my mind all previous impressions gained from reading. I wished to be free for the moment to accept and record the chance invitation or adventure wherever met with at the front, in the streets of Paris, in Ireland, or on the London omnibus. Later on, I hoped to write a book, summarizing the changing social conditions as I had found them. Unfortunately for me, my stay was unexpectedly cut short. I was able to avail myself of but few of the many opportunities offered. With this apology, the articles are presented as they were written. I have given the impression that at the time of my visit there was no lack of food in England, but I fear that I have not done justice to the frugality of the people, much of which was self-imposed for the purpose of helping to win the war. On very good authority, I have been given to understand that food was less abundant during the winter just past, partly because of the effect of the severe weather on our American railroads, which had trouble in getting supplies to the coast, and partly because more and more ships were required for transporting American troops and supplies for these troops to France. This additional curtailment was most felt by families of small income, whose earners were at the front or away on other government service. Mothers had great difficulty in getting adequate nourishment for growing children. But the British people cheerfully submitted to this further deprivation. Summer is at hand. It is to be hoped that before another winter sets in, American and British shipping will have sufficiently increased to remedy the situation. In regard to what I have said of the British Army, I was profoundly struck as were other visitors to that front, by the health and morale of the men, by the marvel of organization accomplished in so comparatively brief a time. It was one of the many proofs of the extent to which the British nation had been socialized. When one thought of that little band of regulars sent to France in 1914, who became immortal at Mons, who shared the glory at the Marne, and in that first dreadful winter held back the German hosts from the Channel ports, the presence in the battle line of millions of disciplined and determined men seemed astonishing indeed. And this had been accomplished by a nation facing the gravest crisis in its history, under the necessity of sustaining and financing many allies and of protecting an empire. Since my return to America, a serious reverse has occurred. After the Russian peace, the Germans attempted to overwhelm the British by hurling against them vastly superior numbers of highly trained men. It is for the military critic of the future to analyze any tactical errors that may have been made at the Second Battle of the Somme. Apparently there was an absence of preparation, of specific orders from high sources in the event of having to cede ground. This much can be said, that the morale of the British army remains unimpaired, that the presence of mind and ability of the great majority of the officers, who, flung on their own resources, conducted the retreat, cannot be questioned.
while the accomplishment of General Carey in stopping the gap with an improvised force of non-combatants will go down in history in an attempt to bring home to myself, as well as to my readers, a realization of what American participation in this war means, or should mean. End of Preface A Traveler in Wartime by Winston Churchill This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times A Traveler in Wartime Chapter 1 Toward the end of the summer of 1917, it was very hot in New York, and hotter still aboard the transatlantic liner thrust between the piers. One glance at our cabins, and the crowded decks and dining room, at the little writing room above where the ink had congealed in the ink wells, sufficed to bring home to us that the days of luxurious sea travel, of a la carte restaurants, and Louis C.'s bedrooms were gone, at least for a period. The prospect of a voyage of nearly two weeks was not enticing. The ship, to be sure, was far from being the best of those still running on a line which had gained a magic reputation of immunity from submarines. Three years ago she carried only second and third class passengers. But most of us were in a hurry to get to the countries where war had already become a grim and terrible reality. In one way or another we had all enlisted. By we, I mean the American passengers. The first welcome discovery among the crowd wandering aimlessly and somewhat disconsolately about the decks was the cheerful face of a friend whom at first I did not recognize because of his amazing disguise and uniform. Hitherto he had been associated in my mind with dinner parties and clubs. That life was past. He had laid up in his yacht and joined the Red Cross, and henceforth, for an indeterminable period, he was to abide amidst the discomforts and dangers of the Western Front, with five days' leave every three months. The members of a group similarly attired, whom I found gathered by the after-rail, were likewise cheerful. Two well-known specialists from the Massachusetts General Hospital made significant the hegira now taking place that threatens to leave our country, like Britain, almost doctorless. When I reached France, it seemed to me that I met all the celebrated medical men I had ever heard of. A third in the group was a businessman from the Middle West, who had wound up his affairs and left a startled family in charge of a trust company. Though his physical activities had hitherto consisted of an occasional mild game of golf, he wore his khaki like an old campaigner, and he seemed undaunted by the prospect, still somewhat remotely ahead of him, of a winter journey across the Albanian mountains from the Aegean to the Adriatic. After a restless night, we sailed away in the hot dawn of a Wednesday. The shores of America faded behind us, and as the days went by, we had the odd sense of threading uncharted seas. We found it more and more difficult to believe that this empty, lonesome ocean was the Atlantic of the twentieth century. Once we saw a foremaster, once a shy, silent steamer avoided us, westward bound, and once in mid-ocean, tossed on a sea sun-silvered under a rack of clouds, we overtook a gallant little schooner out of New Bedford, or Gloucester, a fourth fairer too. Meanwhile, amongst the Americans, the socializing process had begun. Many elements which, in a former stratified existence, would never have been brought into contact, were fusing by the pressure of a purpose, of a great adventure, common to us all. On the upper deck, high above the waves, was a little fumoir, which, by some odd trick of association, reminded me of the villa formerly occupied by the Kaiser in Corfu, perhaps because of the faience plaques set in the walls. 
although I cannot now recall whether the villa had faience plaques or not. The room was, of course, on the order of a French provincial café, and as such delighted the bourgeoisie monopolizing the alcove tables and joking with the fat steward. Here in this fumoir, lawyers, doctors, businessmen of all descriptions, newspaper correspondents, movie photographers, and millionaires who had never crossed save in a cabin de luxe, rubbed elbows, and exchanged views, and played bridge together. There were YMCA people on their way to the various camps, reconstruction workers intending to build temporary homes for the homeless French, and youngsters in the uniform of the American Field Service going over to drive camions and ambulances, many of whom, without undue regret, had left college after a freshman year. They invaded the fumoir undaunted, to practice atrocious French on the phlegmatic steward. They took possession of a protesting piano in the banal little salon, and sang, We're not coming back till it's over over there. And in the evening, on the darkened decks, we listened and thrilled to the refrain. There's a long, long trail a-winding into the land of my dreams. We were Argonauts. Even the Red Cross ladies, on their way to establish rest camps behind the lines, and brave the mud and rains of a winter in eastern France. None, indeed, were more imbued with the forth-faring spirit than these women, who were leaving, without regret, sheltered, comfortable lives, to face hardships and brave dangers without a question, and no sharper proof of the failure of the old social order to provide for human instincts and needs could be found than the conviction they gave of new and vitalizing forces released in them. The timidities with which their sex is supposedly encumbered had disappeared, and even the possibility of a disaster at sea held no terrors for them. When the sun fell down into the warm waters of the Gulf Stream, and the cabins below were sealed, and thus become insupportable, they settled themselves for the night in their steamer chairs, and smiled at the remark of Monsieur le Commissaire that it was a good season for submarines. The moonlight filtered through the chinks in the burlap shrouding the deck. About 3 a.m., the khaki-clad lawyer from Milwaukee, became communicative. The Red Cross ladies produced chocolate. It was the genial hour before the final nap, from which one awoke abruptly at the sound of squeegees and brooms to find the deck a river of seawater, on whose banks a wild scramble for slippers and biscuit boxes invariably ensued. No experience could have been more socializing. "'Well, it's a relief!' one of the ladies exclaimed not to be traveling with half a dozen trunks and a hat-box. Oh, yes, I realize what I'm doing. I'm going to live in one of those flimsy portable houses with twenty cots and no privacy and wear the same clothes for months. But it's better than thrashing around looking for something to do and never finding it, never getting anything real to spend one's energy on. I've closed my country house. I've sublet my apartment. I've done with teas and bridge and I'm happier than I've been in my life, even if I don't get enough sleep. Another lady, who looked still young and had two sons in the army, there was nothing for me to do but sit around the house and wait, and I want to be useful. My husband has to stay at home. He can't leave his business. Be useful. There she struck the new and aggressive note of emancipation from the restricted self-sacrifice of the old order of wider surface for the unnamed and the unknown, and, above all, for the wider self-realization of which service is but a by-product. I recall particularly among these women a young widow with an eager look in clear gray eyes that gazed eastward into the unknown with hope renewed. Had she lived a quarter of a century ago, she might have been doomed to slow desiccation. There are thousands of such women in France today, and to them the great war has brought salvation. 
From what country other than America could so many thousands of pilgrims, even before our nation had entered the war, have hurried across a wide ocean to take their part? No matter what religion we profess, whether it be Calvinism or Catholicism, we are individualists, pragmatists, empiricists, forever. Our faces are set towards strange worlds, presently to rise out of the sea and take on form and color and substance, worlds of new aspirations, of new ideas and new values. And on this voyage, I was reminded of Josiah Royce's splendid summary of the American philosophy, of the American religion as set forth by William James. Quote, the spirit of the frontiersman, of the gold seeker, or the home builder, transferred to the metaphysical or to the religious realm. There is a far off home, our long lost spiritual fortune. Experience alone can guide us to the place where these things are. Hence, indeed, you need experience. You can only win your way on the frontier unless you are willing to live there. Unquote. Through the pall of horror and tragedy, the American sees a vision. For him it is not merely a material and bloody contest of arms and men, a military victory to be gained over an aggressive and wrong-minded people. It is a world calamity, indeed, but a calamity, since it has come, to be spiritualized and utilized for the benefit of the future society of mankind. It must be made to serve a purpose in helping to liberate the world from sentimentalism, ignorance, close-mindedness, and can't. Part 2 One night we entered the danger zone. There had been an entertainment in the little salon which, packed with passengers, had gradually achieved the temperature and humidity of a Turkish bath, for the ports had been closed as tight as gaskets could make them. The electric fans, as usual, obstinately refused to march. After the amateur speech-making and concert pieces, an Italian violinist, who had thrown over a lucrative contract to become a soldier, played exquisitely, and one of the French sisters we had seen walking the deck with the mincing steps of the cloister sang, somewhat precariously and pathetically, the Ave Maria. Its pathos was of the past, and after she had finished, as we fled into the open air, we were conscious of having turned our backs irrevocably, yet determinedly, upon an era whose life and convictions the music of the composer so beautifully expressed. And the sister's sweet, withered face was reminiscent of a missal, one bright with color and still shining faintly, a missal in a library of modern books. On deck, a fine rain was blowing through a gap in a burlap shroud, a phosphorescent fringe of foam hissed along the sides of the ship, giving the illusory appearance of our dead lights open and ablaze, exaggerating the sinister blackness of the night. We were, apparently, a beacon in that sepia waste where modern undersea monsters were lurking. There were on board other elements which, in the normal times gone by, would have seemed disquieting enough. The evening after we had left New York, while we were still off the coast of Long Island, I saw in the poop a crowd of steerage passengers listening intently to harangues by speakers addressing them from the top of a pile of life rafts. Armenians, I was told, on their way to fight the Turks, all recruited in America by one frenzied woman who had seen her child cut in two by a German officer. Twilight was gathering as I joined the group. The sea was silvered by the light of an August moon, floating serenely between swaying stays. The orator's passionate words and gestures evoked wild responses from his hearers, whom the drag of an ancient hatred had snatched from the peaceful asylum of the West. The smiling, happy folk, which I had seen in our manufacturing towns and cities, were now transformed, atavistic, all save one, a student, who stared wistfully through his spectacles across the waters. Later, when twilight deepened, when the moon had changed from silver to gold, the orators gave place to a singer. He had been a boot-black in America. Now he had become a bard. 
his plaintive minor chant evoked one knew not how the flavor of that age-long history of oppression and wrong these were now determined to avenge their conventional costumes were proof that we had harbored them almost indeed assimilated them and suddenly they had reverted they were going to slaughter the turks on a bright saturday afternoon we steamed into the wide mouth of the Chiron, a name stirring vague memories of romance and terror the french passengers gazed wistfully at the low-lying strip of sand and forest but our uniformed pilgrims crowded the rail and hailed it as the promised land of self-realization a richly colored watering place slid into view as in a moving picture show there was indeed all the reality and unreality of the cinematograph about our arrival presently the real would end abruptly and we should find ourselves pushing our way out of the emptying theatre into a rainy street the impression of unreality in the face of visual evidence persisted into the night when after an afternoon at anchor we glided up the river our decks and ports ablaze across the land silhouettes of tall poplars loomed against the blackness occasionally a lamp revealed the milky blue facade of a house this was france war-torn france at last vividly brought home to us when a glare appeared on the sky growing brighter and brighter until at a turn of the river abruptly we came abreast of vomiting furnaces thousands of electric lights strung like beads over the crest of a hill and below these dim rows of houses all of a sameness stretching along monotonous streets a munitions town in the night one could have tossed a biscuit on the stone wharfs where the workmen crouching over their tasks straightened up at sight of us and cheered and one cried out hoarsely vous venez nous sauver vous américain you come to save us an exclamation i was to hear again in the days that followed part three all day long as the rapide hurried us through the smiling wine country and past the well-remembered chateaus of the loire we wondered how we should find paris beautiful paris save from violation as by a miracle our first discovery after we had pushed our way out of the dim station into the obscurity of the street was that of the absence of taxicabs the horse-drawn buses ranged along the curb were reserved for the foresighted and privileged few men and women were rushing desperately about in search of conveyances and in the midst of this confusion undismayed debonair i spied a rugged slouch-hatted figure standing under a lamp the unmistakable american soldier aren't there any cabs in paris i asked oh yes they tell me they're here he said i've given a man a dollar to chase one evidently one of our millionaire privates who have aroused such burnings in the heart of the french poilu with his five sous a day we left him there and staggered across the seine with our bags a french officer approached us you come from america he said let me help you there was just enough light in the streets to prevent us from getting utterly lost and we recognized the dark mass of the tuileries as we crossed the gardens the hotel we sought was still there and its menu save for the war bread and the tiny portion of sugar as irreproachable as ever the next morning as if by magic hundreds of taxis had sprung into existence though they were much in demand and in spite of the soldiers thronging the sunlit streets paris was seemingly the same paris one had always known gay insouciant pleasure bent the luxury shops appeared to be thriving the world-renowned restaurants to be doing business as usual to judge from the prices a little better than usual the expensive hotels were full it is not the real france of course yet it seemed none the less surprising that it should still exist oddly enough the presence of such overwhelming numbers of soldiers should have failed to strike the note of war 
emphasized that of lavishness of the casting off of mundane troubles for which the french capital has so long been known but so it was most of the soldiers were here precisely with the object of banishing from their minds the degradations and horrors of the region from which they had come and which was so unbelievably near a few hours in an automobile less than that in one of those dragonfly machines we saw intermittently hovering in the blue above our heads paris to most americans means that concentrated little district de luxe of which the place vendome is the centre and we had always unconsciously thought of it as in the possession of the anglo-saxons so it seems to-day one saw hundreds of french soldiers of course in all sorts of uniforms from the new grey-blue and visor to the traditional cloth blouse and kepi once in a while a smart french officer the english and canadians the australians new zealanders and americans were much in evidence set them down anywhere on the face of the globe under any conditions conceivable and you could not surprise them such was the impression the british officers and even the british tommies were blasé wearing the air of the semaine anglaise and the five o'clock tea as the french delight to call it that these could have come direct from the purgatory of the trenches seemed unbelievable the anzacs with looped-up hats strolled about enjoying themselves halting before the shops at the rue de la Paix to gaze at the priceless jewelry there or stopping at a sidewalk cafe to enjoy a drink our soldiers had not seen the front many of them no doubt were on leave from the training camps others were on duty in paris but all seemed in a hurry to get somewhere bound for a definite destination they might have been in new york or san francisco it was a novel sight indeed to observe them striding across the place vendome without so much as deigning to cast a glance at the column dedicated to the great emperor who fought that other world war a century ago to see our square-shouldered officers hustling around corners in ford and packard automobiles and the atmosphere of our communication headquarters was so essentially one of getting things done as to make one forget the medieval narrowness of the rue saint anne and the inconvenient french private dwelling arrangements of the house you were transported back to america such too was the air of our red cross establishment in the ancient building facing the palace de la concorde where the unfortunate louis lost his head history had been thrust into the background i was never more aware of this than when shortly after dawn wednesday the massive gray pile of the palace of versailles suddenly rose before me as the motor shot through the empty place d'armes i made a desperate attempt to summon again a vivid impression when i had first stood there many years ago of an angry paris mob beating against that grill of the swiss guards dying on the stairway for their queen but it was no use france had undergone some subtle change yet i knew i was in france i knew it when we left paris and sped through the dim leafy tunnels of the bois when i beheld a touch of filtered sunlight on the dense blue thatch of the maroniers behind the walls of a vast estate once dedicated to the sports and pleasures of kings when i caught glimpses of silent chateaus mirrored in still waters i was on my way with one of our naval officers to visit an american naval base on the western coast it was france but the laughter had died on her lips a few women and old men and children were to be seen in the villages a bent figure in a field an occasional cart that drew aside as we hurried at eighty kilometers an hour along deserted routes drawn as with a ruler across the land sometimes the road dipped into a canyon of poplars and the sky between their crests was a tiny strip of mottled blue and white the sun crept in and out the clouds cast shadows on the hills here and there the tower of lonely church or castle broke the line of a distant ridge 
Morning glories nodded over lodge walls where the ivy was turning crimson, and the little gardens were masses of colors, French colors, like that in the beds of the Tuileries, brick-red geraniums and dahlias, yellow marigolds, and purple asters. We lunched at one of the little inns that for generations have been tucked away in the narrow streets of provincial towns. This time a cheval blanc, with an unimposing front and a blaze of sunshine in its heart. After a déjeuner fit for the most exacting of bon viveurs, we sat in that courtyard and smoked, while an ancient waiter served us with coffee that dripped through silver percolators into our glasses. The tourists have fled. "'If happily you should come again, monsieur,' said madame, as she led me with pardonable pride through her immaculate bedrooms and salons with wavy floors. And I dwelt upon a future holiday there, on the joys of sharing with a friend that historic place. The next afternoon I lingered in another town, built on a little hill ringed about with ancient walls, from whose battlements tide-veined marshes stretched away to a gleaming sea. A figure flitting through the cobbled streets, a woman in black who sat sewing, sewing in a window, only served to heighten the impression of emptiness, to give birth to the odd fancy that some alchemic quality in the honeyed sunlight now steeping, it must have preserved the place through the ages. But in the white clothes surrounding the church were signs that life still persisted. A peasant was drawing water at the pump and the handle made a noise. A priest chatted with three French ladies who had come over from a neighboring seaside resort, and then a woman in deep mourning emerged from a tiny shop and took her bicycle from against the wall and spoke to me. Vous êtes américain, monsieur? I acknowledged it. Vous venez nous sauver? The same question I had heard on the lips of the workman in the night I hope so, madame, I replied, and would have added, we come also to save ourselves. She looked at me with sad, questioning eyes, and I knew that for her, and alas for many like her, we were too late. When she had mounted her wheel and ridden away, I bought a matin, and sat down on a doorstep to read about Kerensky and the Russian Revolution. The thing seemed incredible here, War seemed incredible, and yet its tentacles had reached out to this peaceful old world spot and taken a heavy toll. Once more I sought the ramparts, only to be reminded of those crumbling, matriculated ruins that I was in a war-ridden land. Few generations had escaped the pestilence. At no great distance lay the little city which had been handed over to us by the French government for a naval base one of the ports where our troops and supplies are landed. Those who know provincial France will visualize its narrow streets and reticent shops, its grey-white and ecru houses, all more or less of the same design, with long French windows guarded by ornamental balconies of cast iron. A city that has never experienced such a thing as a real estate boom. Imagine, against such background, the bewildering effect of the dynamic presence of a few regiments of our new army. It is a curious commentary on this war that one does not think of these young men as soldiers, but as citizens engaged in a scientific undertaking of a magnitude unprecedented. You come unexpectedly upon truckloads of tanned youngsters whose features, despite flannel shirts and campaign hats, summon up memories of Harvard Square and the Yale Yard, of campuses at Berkeley and Ithaca. The youthful drivers of these camions are alert, intent, but a hard day's work on the docks by no means suffices to dampen the spirits of the passengers, who whistle ragtime airs as they bump over the cobbles. And the note they strike is presently sustained by a glimpse on a siding of an efficient-looking baldwin ranged alongside several of the tiny french locomotives of yesterday sustained too by an acquaintance with the young colonel in command of the town though an officer of the regular army he brings home to one the fact that the days of the military's martinet have gone forever he is military 
indeed erect and soldierly, but fortune has amazingly made him a mayor and an autocrat, a builder, and in some sense a railway manager and superintendent of docks. And to these functions have been added those of police commissioner, of administrator of social welfare and hygiene. It will be a comfort to those at home to learn that their sons in our army in France are cared for as no enlisted men have ever been cared for before. Part 4 By the end of September I had reached England, eager to gain a fresh impression of conditions there. The weather in London was mild and clear. The third evening after I had got settled in one of those delightfully English hotels in the heart of the city, yet removed from the traffic with letter-boxes that still bear the initials of Victoria, I went to visit some American naval officers in their sitting-room on the ground floor. The cloth had not been removed from the dinner-table, around which we were chatting, when a certain strange sound reached our ears, a sound not to be identified with the distant roar of the motor-buses in Pall Mall, nor with the sharp bark of the taxi-horns, although not unlike them. We sat listening intently, and heard the sound again. "'The Germans have come,' one of the officers remarked, as he finished his coffee. The other looked at his watch. It was nine o'clock. "'They must have left the lines about seven, he said. In spite of the fact that our newspapers at home had made me familiar with these aeroplane raids, as I sat there, amidst those comfortable surroundings, the thing seemed absolutely incredible. To fly one hundred and fifty miles across the Channel and southern England, bomb London, and fly back again by midnight. We were going to be bombed. The anti-aircraft guns were already searching the sky for the invaders. It is sinister, and yet you are seized by an overwhelming curiosity that draws you first to pull aside the heavy curtains of the window, and then to rush out into the dark street, both proceedings in the worst possible form. The little street was deserted, but in Pall Mall the dark forms of buses could be made out scurrying for shelter. One wondered where. Above the roar of London, the pop, pop, pop of the defending guns could be heard now almost continuously, followed by the shrieks and moans of the shrapnel shells as they passed close overhead. They sounded like giant rockets, and even as rockets some of them broke into a cascade of sparks. Star shells, they are called, bursting, it seemed, among the immutable stars themselves that burned serenely on. And there were other stars, like November meteors, hurrying across space the lights of the British planes scouring the heavens for their relentless enemies. Everywhere the restless white rays of their searchlights pierced the darkness, seeking, but seeking in vain. Not a sign of the intruders was to be seen. I was induced to return to the sitting-room. "'But what are they shooting at?' I asked. "'Listen,' said one of the officers. There came a lull in the firing, and then a faint droning noise, like the humming of insects, on a still summer day. It's all they have to shoot at, that noise. "'But their own planes?' I objected. "'The Gotha has two engines. It has a slightly different noise, when you get used to it. You'd better step out of that window. It's against the law to show light, and if a bomb falls in the street you'd be filled with glass.' I overcame my fascination and obeyed. It isn't only the bombs, my friend went on. It's the falling shrapnel, too. The noise made by those bombs is unmistakable, unforgettable, and quite distinct from the chorus of the guns and shrapnel. A crashing note, reverberating, sustained, like the E minor of some giant calliope. In the face of the raids, which coincide with the coming of the moon, London is calm but naturally indignant over such methods of warfare. The damage done is ridiculously small, the percentage of deaths and injuries insignificant. There exists in every large city a riff-raff to get panicky. These are mostly foreigners. They seek the tubes, and some the crypt of St. Paul's, for it is wise to get under shelter during the brief period of the raids. 
and most citizens obey the warnings of the police. It is odd, indeed, that more people are not hurt by shrapnel. The Friday following the raid I have described, I went out of town for a weekend, and returned on Tuesday to be informed that a shell had gone through the roof outside of the room I had vacated, and the ceiling and floor of the bedroom of one of the officers who lived below. He was covered with dust and debris. His lights went out, but he calmly stepped through the window. "'You'd best have your dinner early, sir,' I was told by the waiter on my return. "'Last night a lady had her soup upstairs, her chicken in the office, and her coffee in the cellar.' It is worth while noting that she had all three. Another evening, when I was dining with Sir James Barry, he showed me a handful of shrapnel fragments. I gathered them off the roof, he informed me, and a lady next to whom I had sat at luncheon told me in a matter-of-fact tone that a bomb had fallen the night before in the garden of her townhouse. It was quite disagreeable, she said, and broke all our windows on that side. During the last raids before the moon disappeared, by a new and ingenious system of barrage fire, the Germans were driven off. The question of the ethics of reprisals is agitating London. One raid, which occurred at midday, is worth recording. I was on my way to our embassy when, in the residential quarter, through which I passed, I found all the housemaids in the areas gazing up at the sky, and I was told by a man in a grocer's cart that the Huns had come again. But the invader on this occasion turned out to be a British aviator from one of the camps who was bringing a message to London. The warmth of his reception was all that could be desired, and he alighted hastily in the first open space that presented itself. Looking back to the time when I left America, I can recall the expectation of finding a Briton beginning to show signs of distress. I was prepared to live on a small ration, and the impression of the scarcity of food was seemingly confirmed when the table was being set for the first meal at my hotel. When the waiter, who chanced to be an old friend, pointed to a little bowl half full of sugar and exclaimed, "'I ought to warn you, sir,' It's all you're to have for a week, and I'm sorry to say you're only allowed a bit of bread, too. It is human perversity to want a great deal of bread when bread becomes scarce. Even war bread, which, by the way, is better than white. But the rest of the luncheon, when it came, proved that John Bull was under no necessity of stenting himself. Save for wheat and sugar, he is not in want. Everywhere in London you are confronted by signs of an incomprehensible prosperity. Everywhere, indeed, in Great Britain. There can be no doubt about that of the wage earners. Nothing like it has ever been seen before. One sure sign of this is the phenomenal sale of pianos to households whose occupants had never dreamed of such luxuries. And not once, but many times, have I read in the newspapers of working men's families of four and five, which are gaining collectively more than five hundred pounds a year. The economic and social significance of this tendency, the new attitude of the working classes, the ferment it is causing, need not be dwelt upon here. That England will be a changed England is unquestionable. The London theatres are full, the movies crowded, and you have to wait your turn for a seat at a restaurant. Bond Street and Piccadilly are doing a thriving business. Never so thriving, you are told, and presently you are willing to believe it. The vendor beggars, so familiar a sight a few years ago, have all but disappeared, and you may walk from Waterloo Station to the Haymarket without so much as meeting a needy soul anxious to carry your bag. Taxicabs are in great demand and one odd result of the scarcity of what the English are pleased to call petrol, by which they mean gasoline, is the reappearance of that respectable but almost obsolete animal, the family carriage horse. Of that equally obsolete vehicle, the Victoria, the men on the box are invariably in black. In spite of taxes to make the hair of any American turn gray, in spite of lavish charities, the wealthy classes still seem wealthy, 
if the expression may be allowed. That they are not so wealthy as they were goes without saying. In the country houses of the old aristocracy the most rigid economy prevails. There are new fortunes, undoubtedly, munitions and war fortunes made before certain measures were taken to control profits, and some establishments, including a few supported by American accumulations, still exhibit the number of men servants and amount of gold plate formerly thought adequate. But in most of these great houses, maids have replaced the butlers and footmen. Mansions have been given over for hospitals, gardeners are fighting in the trenches, and courts and drives of country places are often overgrown with grass and weeds. "'Yes, we do dine in public quite often,' said a very great lady. "'It's cheaper than keeping servants.' Two of her three sons had been killed in France, but she did not mention this. The English do not advertise their sorrows. Still another explanation, when husbands and sons and brothers come back across the channel for a few days' leave, after long months in the trenches, nothing is too good for them. And when these days have flown, there is always the possibility that there may never be another leave. Not long ago I read a heart-rending article about the tragedies of the goodbyes in the stations and the terminal hotels, tragedies hidden by silence and a smile. "'Well, so long,' says an officer. "'Bring back a V.C.,' cries his sister from the group on the platform, and he waves his hand in deprecation as the train pulls out, lights his pipe, and pretends to be reading the sphere. Some evening, perchance, you happen to be in the dark street outside of Charing Cross Station. An occasional hooded lamp throws a precarious gleam on a long line of men carrying, so gently, stretchers on which lie the silent forms of rich and poor alike. End of Chapter 1